Okay, we are live. Okay. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Wes Glinsman. I'm the Executive Director of the Oklahoma State Medical Association. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all today for today's discussion on a really very important and timely topic, COVID-19 telling my story. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we get started. First and foremost, we want to say thank you to our other presenting sponsors who made today's CME possible. So big thank you to PLICO, to the Oklahoma State Board of Medical Licensure and Supervision, and to the Telogen Community Initiative. I'd also like to thank OSMA CME Manager Sandy Deba, along with OSMA staff Sharon Westmoreland and Jennifer Dennis-Smith for helping make today's presentation possible. So during the course of today's presentation, if you have questions, please type them into the comment section on the YouTube page. Time permitting at the end of our speaker's presentations today, we'll uh, go back and, and we'll offer up some of those questions to the speakers. Information on how you can receive your CME credit can be found on our website at okmedmed.org. You can also go there to find copies of today's presentations and more information about our speakers. So with that, it's my honor today to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Chris Suddeth is a fourth generation Oklahoman from Pittsburgh County. After graduating from Oklahoma Baptist University, he completed his medical training at the University of Oklahoma. Along the way, he earned a Master of Public Health degree in Health Administration and Policy. He then completed a residency in Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the OU School of Community Medicine in Tulsa. He has practiced extensively as a hospital doctor, but most recently has launched Remedy Health Direct Primary Care in September of 2018. He served on the OSMA Board of Trustees as Vice Chair of the Rural Physician Section and as Vice Chair of the AMA Resident and Fellow Section. He currently serves on the Tulsa County Medical Society Board of Trustees. Dr. Suddeth and his wife Becca have four, as he puts it, handsome, talented, fun, and very rambunctious sons. Uh, our second presenter today is Dr. Art Rousseau. Dr. Rousseau received his medical degree in 1978 from the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine and in 1982 completed his psychiatric residency training at Oregon State Hospital in Salem, Oregon. His training emphasized the social, biological, and psychoanalytical models used, utilized in psychiatry. Dr. Rousseau is board certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and has received the Distinguished Life Fellow Award from the American Psychiatric Association. During his career, he's been the medical director of the Mercy Psychiatric Center, president of the Central Oklahoma Psychiatric Society, co-chair of the Patients Coalition of Oklahoma and president of the Oklahoma Psychiatric Physicians Association. While president of, of the OPPA, he was the 1996 recipient of the Bruno Lima Award from the American Psychiatric Association for his work following the 1995 Murrah bombing. Our third presenter today is Dr. Dale Bratzler, recently appointed OU University Chief COVID Officer. He's also the professor and chair of the Department of Health Administration and Policy at the Hudson College of Public Health and professor in the College of Medicine at the OU Health Sciences Center. He currently serves as Enterprise Chief Quality Officer for, for the three hospital health system and faculty practice at OU Medicine. His experience in healthcare quality improvement includes working with CMS on development, development and maintenance of national performance measures, excuse me, uh, used to profile and report on the quality of inpatient and, and outpatient healthcare. He served two terms as the president of the American Health Quality Association and is a past member of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality National Advisory Council. He has given more than 600 lectures nationally on healthcare quality topics with a particular emphasis on prevention of surgical site infections and adult vaccination. Board certified in internal medicine, he's a master fellow of the American College of Osteopathic Internists and a fellow of the Infectious Diseases Societies of America. So with that, we'll begin today's formal presentation. What we plan to do is have Dr. Suddeth, Dr. Rousseau, and Dr. Bratzler each make their presentations. And then, as I mentioned, hopefully we'll have some time for questions, which you can post in the comment section during the live broadcast. Please note that the chat function will be live during the event only. If you have questions, please type them in that section on the YouTube page, and then time permitting, we'll get to those at the end. Uh, the faculty, the OSMA, the CME Planning Committee, reviewer and moderator have no relevant financial relationships to disclose and the OSMA CME manager has reviewed all information and has resolved all conflicts of interest if applicable. So with that, Dr. Suddeth, the floor is yours. Thank you, Wes, and it's certainly my pleasure to speak to you all, and I appreciate that roaring applause. Uh, there's so many of you in the crowd today. Uh, it's just really overwhelming uh, to be speaking for such a large group of, you know, 20,000 here uh, in the BOK Center. So. Um, really exciting. 
this is such an important topic, such a timely one, and such a historical one. And uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm the first of a couple that you'll hear from today that have actually experienced this uh, firsthand and has been stricken with this uh, terrible disease. I, as Wes had mentioned, I do have four uh, fantastic and rambunctious boys. And uh, back in March, the week after spring break, when, when you know, most kids uh, on any other year would have already returned to school, they were still at home. Because um, as, as you know, by that, by that point, schools had closed uh, and uh, it was soon determined that schools would not open back up. And so uh, we entered summer break a little early and, and uh, daddy returned home from the hospital and uh, was uh, playing outside, running up and down our long driveway on our 16 acre farm and uh, pushing my boys in their various little cars because uh, my boys are, are little. I have four and the oldest is nine. So nine, seven, four and two. And uh, I think I ran that day more than I had in, in quite some time. And so I was a little winded and tired and sweaty. And, and you know, the allergies are starting to kick in too. So, uh, and I have allergies. So the next day I returned to the hospital and I'm coughing a little bit. And uh, thanks, Wes. And so you can actually see that slide, the top left corner, there I am pushing my boys, for those of you who can, can view uh, the slides. And uh, the next day I returned to work and there I am, I'm, I'm donned in my personal protective equipment. I have my yellow gown, my uh, N95 mask on, that's pretty much like 24 karat gold. Um, and, uh, and then I'm seeing patients who have coronavirus. Uh, and behind you was the makeshift uh, coronavirus unit or ICU at Jane Phillips Medical Center in Bartlesville. Now, what you don't realize in, in these photos is uh, when I took that picture, I had already contracted coronavirus. And it was, it was just a, a day later before I realized that when symptoms really uh, began and, and I additionally had fever. So how did I contract that? Well, if you back up about five days, I had returned to the hospital for my first day of several days in a row that I was scheduled to work. And as I was looking through my patient list, I noticed that uh, there was a patient who had been in the hospital for five days and had fever, cough, shortness of breath, uh, respiratory distress, hypoxemia, but for some reason had not been tested. So reasonably, I called the floor, spoke to the nurse, you know, hey, who's taking care of a patient in 578? And, and I uh, talked to that nurse and I said, listen, this guy, he needs to be in isolation. He meets all the criteria for COVID-19 and we need to get him tested immediately. And, and she proceeded, she got him tested. He was placed in isolation. I then later went to the floor to see him. I was standing outside of the room, donning my PPE, reaching for the N95 mask when I was stopped by two uh, infection control officers. And I was, I was told at that point in time that hospital policy did not allow or N95 masks to be used unless the patient had already tested positive for coronavirus. Needless to say, uh, I got coronavirus. So I, I complied, I wore a, reg a regular surgical mask, I walked in, the patient was not wearing a mask, was in respiratory distress, coughed all over me. Unfortunately, there were several other staff who also contracted coronavirus because of that terrible policy. Uh, and, and the thing about it is it was just two days later that the hospital changed its policy. And instead of not being allowed to wear an N95 mask, all, all staff were required to wear an N95 mask for persons under investigation or PUIs. But for me, that was two days too late. So now fast forward back to, to these photos and I had a, a cough. Um, I felt a little short of breath and I thought, well, maybe it's just because of the allergies and 
running outside with my, with my boys. I was sore. But when I had a fever of 101.7, I knew that this was not allergies. And so as you can see in the top right photo, it's not fun to have a piece of plastic stuck into your nose and, you know, all the way back into your brain, right? Uh, I mean, that just that's not, does not feel good. And that's what I, I had to have. I was tested. And then uh, the day after that, I uh, received my results that I had uh, coronavirus. And that began my quarantine at home. And so in the, the bottom two photos, uh, that was a, a selfie I took uh, at my homes, my backyard. And then another picture is a window on the other side of which are my, uh, my mom and my stepfather. And so they came to, to visit and we communicated through the glass. And uh, the first six days of my symptoms, they were very mild. I thought, well, shoot, if this is what it's like, it's not too bad. Unfortunately, uh, the subsequent six days were very different. So again, six days of very mild symptoms, and then all of a sudden a switch was flipped. And I began having persistent fever up to 103.6. I had severe bone aches, severe muscle aches, complete loss of the taste of smell, uh, uh, of taste and, and uh, sense of smell. Uh, I had some chest pain and uh, just felt absolutely terrible. And I couldn't sleep because of being in pain. And I had to force myself to eat. And that was by far the worst illness that I have personally ever experienced. And after the first day, I thought, man, it's just awful. The second day, I thought, well, it's terrible, but, you know, it'll pass soon. I've been sick now for a week. Well, the third day and the fourth day and the fifth day come. And by that point, I'm feeling a little bit of despair. I'm mad. I'm angry that I continue to have these symptoms and that the fever doesn't go away. And mind you, I couldn't touch my wife. I couldn't touch or be around my boys. And the loneliness of this uh, disease course really set in. And uh, you know, I had a I had a friend who texted me, "You should watch Tiger King." So I wasted my life for a few hours and uh, watched Tiger King. Everybody knows that Carol Baskin is guilty. Everybody, there's there's no question. There's clear evidence that supports that. Uh, that anybody who owns a big cat. There's, there's something wrong. Thankfully, there's a psychiatrist who will speak after me who can, uh, who can attest to that fact. Um, and I, you know, so if coronavirus wasn't bad enough, uh, watching Tiger King made it worse. So, uh, of course, I'm just joking, but um, I had several friends throughout that time who texted me, who called me, who were checking in on me sending me words that were very encouraging. And it's amazing in those times of uh, crisis, how many people come out of the woodwork and support you and, just, and how clear your social support system and network becomes. That's exactly what happened for me. And I'm so thankful for all the, for all the folks um, in my life and, and all my spheres of influence who were checking in on me on a regular basis. Uh, when I had over 70 text messages that I had not yet responded to it. You know, that's when it became clear that a lot of folks were genuinely caring for me, praying for me, um, and serving us. Uh, in fact, we had, uh, 24 fruit trees that we had planned to plant. Uh, we'd actually already acquired them, but they weren't in the ground yet. We had a, a group come over and, and even put those in the ground for us. It's such a blessing. But despite all of that, uh, I was still very, uh, just been out of shape. And, you know, when you're, when you're looking at your demise in the eyes, it makes you think about a lot of things. And it reminds you that there are only a few things in life that really matter. And for me, it was that sixth and final day of symptoms on Sunday, April 5th, 
2020, that morning when I reached, when I reached deeply down into my personal faith, and I, I'm personally a Christian, um, but more generally, reaching down into my faith, that I was uplifted. I was encouraged. My hope was renewed. And that afternoon, uh, the symptoms went away. And, it, and then, of course, I spent the subsequent 72 hours that are standard uh, in isolation. And then if you could advance to the next slide, I uh, had that long awaited recovery that was so coveted and was able to uh, hug my boys again. And those are some of the longest hugs I think I've given uh, most of them. And, uh, and it, it was a very stark reminder that at the end of the day, it's uh, m the time I spend with my boys that I, my family that I, I want, I'm going to want more of. It's not, um, you know, can I work some more? Can I go do this activity or that activity more? No, it's, uh, I'm going to want more time with my family. That's what is most important and being reminded of that. Uh, so in terms of community, in my practice in primary care, I talk about the three F's, faith, family, and friends. And I experienced all three of those in very powerful ways uh, throughout my course of coronavirus. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, highlight the absolute importance that quarantine played in all of this. Because just a couple of weeks after I had recovered, two full weeks after I recovered, I was retested. My wife and all four of my boys were tested. And it's very interesting because all five of them tested negative. I'm so thankful. Yay, great. They didn't get it. Quarantine worked. But on another note, I tested positive again. And that was, that brings up a whole another point, which I won't go into detail now, but that is the validity of retesting and the timing of that, especially considering that it's a PCR test that is simply looking for uh, certain, uh, you know, genes and whether or not you have live transmissible virus, uh, the, if it's, if there's even any fragments there, it, it will pick them up and it will pop positive. So that's a, an interesting thought and, and goes beyond the current scope of this conversation and presentation, but quarantining works, wearing masks works. Socially distance, this distancing works. Washing your hands, soap and water. Uh, and if you're symptomatic, staying home away from people. That those are fundamentals. That's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democrat issue. It's not a nationalism issue. It is a common sense. I respect you enough that I'm going to wear a mask issue. Do I care enough about you as my neighbor, as a, as a person in my community, wear a mask? That's the question. And my strong encouragement uh, to all the listeners here today, uh, which was my encouragement when I spoke to the Bixby City Council, my encouragement when I was interviewed by News Channel 6, News Channel 8, when I was um, when I was interviewed by the Tulsa World, wear masks. Heed the guidance of our public health officials and uh, practice common sense. Uh, I mean, for for your sake, for the sake of your neighbors, of the community, of your your parents and grandparents of uh, those who are vulnerable to, the, to this disease. Um, it is absolutely imperative that we do not waver in our resolve um, to uh, use our voices as physicians, as public health uh, officials in uh, encouraging the population to exercise these uh, 
common sense activities to stop the spread, to contain it, and to preserve people's health. So with that, uh, I know there will be an opportunity to answer questions later. Uh, there's so much more of the story I could share, um, but I will gladly turn it over to Dr. Rousseau. Thank you. Figure, I'm got to figure out how to turn the mute off. <laughs> and you know what? I think I actually skipped over you, uh, Wes. I, I don't know if you, if you need to give an introduction for Dr. Rousseau. Uh, that's no, my apologies. That, that is perfectly fine. I've read his bio, and uh, he, 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 he can take it from here. So, Dr. Rousseau, go right ahead. Yes, and thank you for that introduction, and good afternoon, everyone out there. And I also want to thank everyone for allowing me to tell my story. You know, when I was first asked to participate in this presentation, I, I wasn't sure if there's anything to tell regarding my COVID-19 illness. I developed symptoms, I got sick, I convalesced, and then I got better, end of story. But after giving it some thought, I recognized that my experience might be helpful to others and I could possibly benefit from it as well. As we all know, catharsis is good for the soul. Well, with my wife Lila's permission, I'd like to share not only my story, but her story as well. I believe this will illustrate two totally different presentations of the COVID-19 infection. And fortunately, they both have happy endings. <clears throat> I thought an interesting way to approach my part of the presentation is that for the next 20 minutes, as I tell our story, uh, we focus not only on the physical aspects of the COVID-19, that is the specific biological symptoms, but examine the impact of the psychological and sociological aspects of the experience as well. Would you like to put that first slide up for me, please? Now, if I may, and, and Chris, this just goes right along with your presentation. Uh, let me introduce Dr. George Engel's biopsychosocial model as portrayed here in this slide. And as you can see, his model is made up of three overlapping spheres and these three fears interact and affect each other, either by adding to the stress of the illness of the individual leading to a more significant morbidity or mortality, or acting as a protective factor, lessening the illness and its symptoms. And of course, those three spheres are the biological, the psychological, and the sociological aspects of the human condition. So with that in mind, let me begin in telling our story. For those who don't know me, I'm 71 years old and I'm in relatively good health. I often joke that my middle name ought to be pre because I have been diagnosed with pre hypertension and pre type two diabetes, as well as borderline hypercholesterolemia. Now, in an attempt to avoid future problems, my internist, Dr. Dean Druby has placed me on bistolic five milligrams each day. Metformin, 500 milligrams twice a day, and simvastatin, 20 milligrams each day. Now, these treatments have kept me pretty much stable and in good health, but you can see I do have a few risk factors. Now, I like to consider myself living a healthy lifestyle. I keep physically active with moderate exercise, and I continue to practice psychiatry, and I am active in the Oklahoma State Medical Association and the Oklahoma Psychiatric Physicians Association. And I'm also chairman of the Legislative Committee of the OSMA, which <clears throat> I will confess continually tests my cognitive functioning, patience, and temperament, especially while the legislative session uh, is going on, which, by the way, happened to be during my illness and convalescence. <clears throat> so along with that, my personal life is also filled with activities. First, trying to keep up with my wife, Lila. Now, she is four years younger than I, and by the way, only takes a multivitamin each morning. She is as active physically and mentally as me, if not more so. She keeps the books at my office, does volunteer work of all types. And she participates in numerous activities with our seven grandchildren. And I will add that she is an avid student of yoga. Now, although we enjoy our alone time, which was unbelievably a blessing in this isolation, I was able to touch her because she was also exposed and had the virus. Uh, but we attend multiple activities which have large crowds of people. And this would be from church, a uh, number of sporting events, as well as a symphony and Broadway. Now that isn't even counting the activities we attend with our three children and seven grandchildren. This includes being a fan and spectator at many of their activities. But I think you get the point that we keep ourselves pretty busy in a crowded social activities. 
course, the downside of that is we definitely set ourselves up to exposure of all kinds of bugs in these large crowds. And just being with our grandkids, or should I say seven little Petri dishes of viruses and bacteria is a threat to anyone's health. Well, when I try to think back as to when I first began to notice any viral or respiratory symptoms, I have to admit I have great difficulties in identifying exactly when my symptoms began. Of course, that's part of the problem. The incubation period of COVID-19 appears to be so varied it is hard to know when I was exposed. And talking to my doctors, we theorized that the initial exposure could have occurred as early as mid-February. And at that time, we had taken a trip with our son, Justin, and his family to the NASA Space Center in Houston. Now, there was obviously a large crowd assembled there, but I really can't recall developing any uh, symptoms other than a slight cough, uh, which I noticed around April 1st, or I'm sorry, March 1st. Now, around this time, a significant stress to our world occurred. Lila's sister was hospitalized with a reoccurrence of cancer on March 5th. On Monday, March 9th, she passed away and plans of her funeral were set for Saturday, March 14th. Now, Lila admitted that she was feeling fatigued, which we felt was understandable with trips to Tulsa, visiting with family while her sister was in ICU. And then of course, the emotional stress related to her sister's death. But with her fatigue and a very slight cough, to be safe, she went to the Mercy Clinic to check to see if she had the influenza virus. Recognizing if she had the flu, she wasn't gonna to go to the funeral. Well, COVID-19 was not even in our thoughts at that time. And at the clinic, uh, Lila's exam was normal. She had no fever or other viral symptoms. Her tests for influenza A and B were negative. So dis despite her fatigue, she planned to go to the service. And of course, I was thinking at the time I would accompany her. Now, on the evening of Wednesday, March 11th, uh, we headed downtown to watch the Thunder play the Utah Jazz. And as you probably recall, at tip-off, the game was canceled when a player, Rudy Gobert, was diagnosed with COVID-19. Now, I remember feeling fatigued that evening, and as much as I love Thunder baseball, uh, basketball, I was really relieved to get home early. By the time I got home, it was around 8 o'clock, I was experiencing chills, and I checked my temperature, and it was 101.3. So I called my office assistant at that time and told her I was canceling the remainder of the week, which was Thursday and Friday, and that I was going to go to the Mercy Clinic in the morning. Now, this is the date, March 11th, we decided to identify as the beginning of my COVID-19 illness. Well, I took some Tylenol that evening and my fever went down. I slept well that night and wondered if this was just something I needed to ignore, as I frequently do, and just go back to work. Now, I know that I'm not unique as a physician. I attempted to minimize, if not deny, my own symptoms. But that morning, I came close to deciding not to go to the clinic. But since I was planning to go to the funeral services with Lila, I decided I'd go ahead and at least get checked for influenza A and B. Again, COVID-19 was not on my mind. So I went to the clinic on March 12th, and that was around 9 in the morning. The nurse took my vital signs, including temperature, blood pressure, O2 sats, which were 97%. And I was surprised all were normal. And then I saw my doctor, Dr. Matt Austin. Well, after explaining to Dr. Austin my symptoms, we discussed the possibility that I might have had some kind of mild respiratory infection, which I was just now getting over. And he agreed to check for influenza A and B, which, by the way, were negative. And then we discussed the possibility of bronchitis, possibly from an earlier URI. But just to be safe, Dr. Austin ordered a chest X-ray. And although it was read as normal, he felt there was a very slight shadowing in one area that could be an indication of bronchitis. And subsequently, he prescribed doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. He gave me the instructions to stay hydrated, take Tylenol if needed, rest, and of course, call him if the symptoms worsened. Although he mentioned the possibility of COVID-19, we both doubted that that was possible at this time. So I felt a little foolish thinking I had wasted his time, but I had the script, filled it, and went to the office to do some paperwork. So now Friday, March 13th, I felt rested. I went to the office for an afternoon meeting. The meeting involved four people, and although I assured them that my cough was probably bronchitis and not infectious, we did maintain a distance and we had no handshaking. And on a side note, as of this date, no one in that meeting or at the office has developed any COVID-19 symptoms. Well, immediately after the meeting, Alala and I drove to Okmulgee for the funeral services. And although I was prepared to go to the funeral, during the drive to Okmulgee, I began to have significant coughing spells. 
I suggested to Lana that I thought it would be best that I not attend the activities and I would stay in the hotel room. And at that time, I still felt I was not contagious. I was just pretty sure my coughing would scare people. So Lana shared with the family that I was not going to participate in the activities and everyone was very understanding. And of course, in hindsight, we recognize that Lila was clearly exposed and should have been in isolation as well. But her symptoms were totally different at that time. Although her early symptoms were extreme fatigue, she had no significant cough or any fever. It wasn't until we had the COVID-19 antibody test in May that her illness was validated. While the service was well attended with a number of family members from both sides of our family, many are in my age bracket and not surprisingly, many with underlying medical conditions. Well, despite the personal contact Lila had with many of them, none of our family members who were there developed COVID-19. I would add that despite our smoldering early symptoms, we are unaware of any of our family members or work associates developing COVID-19. The evening prior to the funeral, I felt I was getting and developing a fever. I had not brought a thermometer with us, so we went to the closest drugstore to purchase one. Now, getting that thermometer is a whole story in itself, but I won't go into that. We finally did get the thermometer, and I was not surprised I had a fever of 100.1. And so I continued to hydrate, take Tylenol, and isolate myself from any family members other than Lila. Well, following the funeral, we, were, we arrived back on Saturday, March 14th, and on that day, I had received an email from our priest that a member of our church had been diagnosed with COVID-19, and she had attended the same service as we had on March 1st. Well, I gave him a call and informed him that I had developed viral symptoms and I would get to a follow-up to be checked uh, for the COVID-19. I added that I would keep him informed as to the results and how I was doing. Well, since it was the weekend, I wasn't able to contact Dr. Austin until Monday. I finally called the clinic that morning and informed him of my ongoing symptoms and I was possibly exposed to COVID-19. He agreed to test me and as he had told me earlier, he only had 15 test kits. Well, I drove to the clinic where the nurse came out in the parking lot and what appeared to be a full hazmat suit and did another nasal swab. I was told to go home and isolate myself. Now, since Lila did not have any fever, they said that they wouldn't test her, but to consider her exposed and wait for the results. And I was initially told that it would take around six hours. Well, six hours turned into nine days. And that was after I had called Mercy and complained. Now, within three hours after my complaint, I did have my results and they were positive. So that meant Lila and I were both in isolation until we were symptom free for at least three days. And we made uh, sure we had plenty of Tylenol, cough drops, an oximeter, thermometer, and access to movie channels. Now, the only fear that I recall having was when I asked Dr. O uh, Dr. Austin, well, what should I be looking for? And his response was that I need to watch my O2 stats closely. Some people will do well one minute and then they'll crash. Well, not very comforting for either Lila or me. Well, the five weeks of isolation was somewhat of a blur. I would temp, uh, check my temperature and my O2 sats frequently, and I would add, I maintained a fever for 21 days. Never have done that in my whole life. My cough was significant and persistent. We both experienced significant lack of energy and spent a lot of time on the couch. The past the time, we watched the news, which was quite depressing, and we quickly learned to minimize that. So what else did we do? Well, along with movies and nature shows, we made it through all eight seasons of Game of Thrones and God help us, Chris, we watched Tiger King as well. The weeks were only divided by our attending church online and otherwise it was difficult to tell one day from the next. Our kids would send frequent text messages with pictures of how they were doing. We were also able to FaceTime and Zoom with them frequently, that was a great help. There is no question that the internet and social media can definitely be defined as uh, and identified as protective factors in our recovery. So many things that we did in our world was now restricted. It should not be surprising that we felt lost. Much of what Chris was saying, we felt very isolated. Much of what is often defined as our identity was being taken away, not just because of our physical symptoms, but secondary to the very nature of the social isolation that we were experiencing through the shelter in place. Now, one of my saving graces was finding out that the CARES Act loosened the HIPAA restrictions on telemedicine. And I was able to set up an office space in one of my son's old bedrooms. 
our office was closed, but our office assistant was come in, would come in and uh, she would come into the office alone and uh, she would screen calls for us. Uh, she began to set up a schedule for me. And I don't think telemedicine will ever replace face-to-face -face psychiatric treatment, but it is definitely better than nothing at all for the patient, but also for me. So on Monday, March 30th, I saw my first patient remotely. I put on a dress shirt and tie and to answer the burning question, I did have pants on. Now to prove it, Lila sent a picture to our kids. And if you put up the second picture there, uh, second slide. Yeah, I, I commented to Lila not to laugh at me that I was putting on a tie, but I wanted to try to get things back to normal, not only for me, but for my patients. I also had a picture taken in my office and I used it as a virtual background on the Zoom. Now, many of my patients commented how much they appreciated me doing this. So at least some of my identity was getting reinstated. Now, although we were told we could consider ourselves recovered, after three days of being without a fever, my cough continued to persist. So we agreed that we would wait two more weeks before we would feel comfortable about uh, getting around family members. And that was extremely difficult to not be able to hug kids as well as grandkids. And my fever broke on April 2nd. When April 15th came, I was ready to at least get out of the house. So Lana and I went to the office just to see if it was still there and to prepare the office for our new associate, Rick Yokel, who was to join us on May 1st. The next day, April 16th, the Oklahoma Blood Institute called and asked if I would come in for another COVID-19 test, pointing out that if it was negative, I would also be able to give convalescent plasma. I was told that they would have the results back in 24 hours. I really doubted that would happen, but I agreed to get it done. And yes, they were they they had it done in 24 hours because the next day at three o'clock, they called me and said I was negative and asked if I would come in to give plasma that evening. And of course, I agreed and I was told that I could provide enough plasma to treat three COVID-19 patients. So just to summarize real quick here, just to compare the symptoms, my symptoms, as I said, I had a fever and it was uh, lasted for 21 days, ranging from 99 to 101.3. Now that means uh, whenever I got that fever, I was taking Tylenol as soon as it started to decline. I had a persistent cough to the point of having sore ribs and a sternum. I had no shortness of breath or tightness in, uh, in my chest. I had chills, random night sweats. I had a lower appetite and waist weight loss of 15 pounds. And that was in that five week period. Overall aches and pains, fatigue. I did sleep well at night. And if for some reason, I did not cough it during the, uh, when I was sleeping. My O2 sats uh, were low to middle 90s. Uh, and interesting that I had a high pulse rate of 90. Now that's in, with me taking a beta blocker, uh, but it would not drop below 90. Lila's symptoms were totally different. She had red tired eyes. She was hypersensitive to sweet and salty. She was cold all the time, but no chills. Sensation in her throat followed by severe chest and core aches. Extremely tired and hard to rest and, and had to rest during any activity. I mean, she said if she took a shower, she had to sit down and rest a little bit to, to finish it. She had random night sweats, very random cough, no fever. O2 stats stayed in the lower to middle 90s. Uh, she slept well at night as well. She responded well to Tylenol. Her appetite was off and she had a little bit of weight loss and she did have some mild GI symptoms early on. Now let me make this one last point about our experience relating to Lila's COVID-19 testing. His, her situation is a great example as to just how flawed the statistical data regarding this pandemic can be. Now, since she was not tested at the beginning because she didn't have a fever, she was initially absent from the statistics of COVID-19 positive individuals. Well, after talking to her doctors, they recommended that she call the health department and tell them that she had been exposed to COVID-19. Well, so she could at least get tested. And that did work. And she was able to get tested on April 16th. This, of course, is after we had both recovered. Well, it took one week to get her test back. And to no one's surprise, she was negative. Now, she was still in the wrong statistical category of being negative, indicating she had never been sick. So we ordered a COVID-19 antibody test and finally on May 1st, she was identified as COVID-19 positive with antibodies and considered recovered by the Oklahoma Health Department. Now I would add that even though I had given cos uh, convalescent plasma, I had not had a COVID-19 antibody test. I mean, we finally had that done on June 8th, which did come back positive. Now we both feel we have fully recovered and we would like to thank all that helped us through our illness. 
And uh, this last slide, uh, if you put up that last slide for me, please, uh, I'd like to share. This is a picture of one of the daily gifts our daughter Lauren would send to us during her convalescent. And it, it did increase our spirits every day. And of course, the question uh, that I would ask you is, do you think it's a sunrise or a sunset? So anyway, thank you. That's uh, my illness. And I hope uh, that helps some people understand just how crazy this COVID-19 is and the way it presents itself. Right. So uh, shall I turn it over to uh, Dr. Bratzler? Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, Dr. Bratzler was just able to join us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rousseau, for that. I, I can't imagine what 21 days of fever must have been like. So uh, before we turn over to Dr. Bratzler, I did want to make one quick thing. I'm sure there are people watching this that have been through something similar. Um, if, if you or one of your colleagues or somebody you know uh, has gone through this, has tested positive, I want to let you know OSMA has started a support group led by Dr. Rousseau and Dr. Suddeth to help people who have been in this situation or, you know, God forbid, are, are in this situation currently. Uh, so if that's somebody that, that, you know, you watching or you, somebody you know, if you'll just email your contact information to COVID-19 at okmed.org, we'll get you in touch with them. And, uh, you know, just want to let you know that there are resources out there. We do have people, uh, you know, as, as you've seen from these speakers, this disease has attacked everybody differently. Everybody who's gone through it has had different needs, different outcomes, and we certainly want to be a resource and helpful to, to those people. So certainly reach out to us uh, if, if that's something that would be helpful to you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bratzler. Dr. Bratzler, thanks so much for joining us on short notice. We appreciate you being here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Let me share my screen here. All right, you should be able to see my screen now. Wes, can you see it okay? Yeah, it's good. Okay, very good. All right, well, first, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I know many of you wanted to hear Brent Brown, which I always like to hear Brent Brown, but he was not available today uh, because of some unfortunate circumstances here with his practice. So I am uh, stepping in and, and uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the public health interventions to prevent this disease. Um, some of you may know, I have a new role at the university I'm still the Enterprise Chief Quality Officer for OU Medicine, but um, President Harris asked me to take on the role of Chief COVID Officer to help advise him particularly on all the steps and the things that we need to do to reopen the campus. So I'm going to do two things in my presentation today, or three things actually. I'm going to talk first just very, very briefly about the public health interventions to prevent the spread of the disease. I think they're particularly relevant right now as we see a fairly major spike of new cases in Oklahoma. I will share with you the data from Oklahoma through today. I do update it daily for our team here at OU and so I've, I've got it updated and I'll share that with you just so we can um, talk about you know the challenges that we're facing right now. And then at the end I want to spend just a little bit of time about re talking about reopening. Um, uh, some of the things that discussions that we're having uh, with the University at the Health Sciences Center um, uh, as we uh, try to move forward uh, in this pandemic. <clears throat> so I wasn't able to hear the earlier presentations. I, I, Art, I loved your presentation and, and um, <clears throat> it was a very compelling story. Uh, I've seen patients who have been incredibly sick with this disease and are taking very, very long periods of time to recover. And so I don't take this disease lightly in any way though I think many people in the community have um, dismissed this as a, another just simple viral or upper respiratory illness. So a couple of things that we know now about transmission of this virus. One, the, the principal mode of transmission of the virus is respiratory droplets. It's a respiratory virus, primarily from coughing, sneezing, or talking. Um, family members tend to be at greatest risk. In fact, being indoors is the greatest risk. Uh, the most common site of uh, transmission is in the home from one family member that's infected to another. Healthcare professionals have obviously had high risk and then any other close contacts. And what we're seeing now, certainly in our work here at the Health Sciences Center, the Norman campus, and then when you look at the state epi numbers, um, uh, it's younger patients now that are being infected uh, who are very social, who are going into public settings and oftentimes settings where masks are not being worn. 
The other big controversy is about airborne transmission. I'm going to talk briefly about airborne transmission, but some have proposed this as the principal mode of trans, uh, transmission in cruise ships. Um, but these are the small droplets that go much, much farther. They linger in the air and they may cause a transmission. I did want to highlight the CDC recently um, downplayed uh, con contaminated surfaces as a cause of transmission. It's not that it can't occur, uh, but it appears that the vast majority of transmission is occurring because of respiratory droplets. Um, so a couple of things we've learned recently. Remember, everybody tells you to stay six feet apart from other people. Well, that was based on research that was published in the 1930s that showed that that's about how far respiratory droplets went, the larger ones, the five micron or greater respiratory droplets. Uh, and that was based on the technology they had at the time to actually measure it. Uh, but this is a very nice study that was done at MIT that looked at the cloud that comes out of your mouth if you cough or sneeze. Uh, and the interesting thing was this, this cloud, this uh, cloud of aerosols travels um, can go up to 25, 27 feet when you sneeze. So the old th six foot rule <clears throat> is important, particularly for respiratory droplets. But when we think about a sick person who's coughing or sneezing, uh, the aerosol can go much, much farther. Uh, and it's one of the reasons, I'll try to make the case, it's one of the reasons we need to be wearing masks. But the other reason is um, <clears throat> that, um, you know, if you're sick, we don't want you at work. We just don't want you at work uh, because of the possibility of uh, um, contamination of the environment and the air around you. Uh, but then this other study that was published, it came out of the NIH and the University of Pennsylvania. It was a very uh, interesting study where they um, used laser-like photography of a person who was just talking. And they showed that very clearly, as I'm sitting here talking to you, droplets are coming out of my mouth. I don't see them, but they're coming out of my mouth. They don't go very far, two to three feet, uh, but simple words that you say, droplets come out of your mouth. Um, and so if you're close to somebody that's just talking, you can potentially be infected by respiratory droplets. Um, I'll talk more about the study in just a moment because they, they did a very fascinating thing in the study. <clears throat> they also found that the louder you speak, uh, the more droplets that come out of your mouth. I'm going to refer to this paper. It was published in the New England Journal. I'm going to give you a link in my presentation, which I'm happy to share, that I would strongly encourage you to go watch. It has a short video, a 40-second video, that we're using as a part of our education about why people should wear masks now. Another thing we know is that, again, kind of highlighting what we think about probable aerosol-based transmission, this was an outbreak that occurred in China in a restaurant where they highlighted uh, the index case A1. Uh, the air conditioning in the particular restaurant blew across the top of the ceiling, and then most of the return flow followed the floor back to the air conditioner. What they sh showed was people at three different tables in the direction of the airflow uh, were definitely contaminated and developed disease. So we know that, that uh, this disease can transmit in restaurants um, and it's probably related to airflow uh, and also to um, uh, aerosol transmission potentially. And finally, I wanted to just say one more thing. I've been on the media a bunch lately um, I just finished another event where I am strongly promoting that everybody wear a mask in any public setting. Um, this was maybe the best paper I've seen to date that looked at the characteristics uh, and the potential reduction in infections when you physically distance, wear a face mask or eye protection to prevent to uh, prevent person to person transmission. It was uh, published in Lancet just recently, 172 observational studies with 25,000 patients. Physical distancing, and they only used one meter, uh, reduced transmission of the virus by about 82%. Um, it, and they found that the farther you were separated, the greater the reduction. Wearing a mask, that one intervention alone reduced person to person transmission by 85%. 
and eye protection by about uh, 78%. So obviously many people, many of the studies, uh, they had to separate out because they were doing multiple interventions. But if there's one intervention that I want everybody to do in public settings, it's wear a mask because it's, it can dramatically reduce the transmission, person-to-person -person transmission of the virus. Just to show you, I wanted to show you, I know you can't read this, but as a part of the meta-analysis, these were all of the studies they found that evaluated masks. And you can see that the point estimate for every single one of those studies showed reduced transmission of the virus from person to person. And in fact, as I mentioned, very substantial 85% reduction in the rate of transmission. I think it dropped from about 14 and a half percent down to about 2.3% person-to-person -person transmission in their study. So again, if there's nothing else we do at this point in time with the new outbreak, we really need to promote the use of masks in public settings. I won't spend time talking to you guys about this, but this is the graphic I use when I talk to lay people about the different types of masks that are available. And I, I highlight N95s are what we, what we wear when I'm taking care of patients, <clears throat> keep droplets, particulates out of my mouth, and then surgical mask, uh, cloth mask principally to keep uh, droplets in, to keep them from coming out of your mouth. Uh, there is some protection, there, there is some increasing data, a nice study in science not long ago that showed that even wearing a cloth mask, not only does it stop droplets from coming out of your mouth, but it may prevent you from inhaling droplets. So again, universal masking right now in public settings, I think is essential to us getting this pandemic back under control. And this is the paper that was in science. I've given you the reference here, um, but they highlight that aerosol transmission of viruses is probably one of the keys to transmission of this particular virus. And they had this nice graphic that I've used in many presentations for our staff to show why it's important for people to wear a mask to prevent um, transmission of the virus. I'm not gonna try to play the link. I've tried it before. It's a great link. It works on your computer, but over Zoom, it may not work. Uh, but here's the link. And again, I'll share my slides, but this particular link takes you to that short video that's in the New England Journal of Medicine in the study from um, uh, NIH and the University of Pennsylvania, where they had that person just saying the phrase, stay healthy, stay healthy taking the laser light photography, they showed all the droplets coming out of his mouth, and then they put a cloth mask on. And it's very obvious, the dramatic reduction in the number of droplets that come out of the person's mouth just wearing a cloth mask. So it really provides, it. it's a great one, a video that we use for part of our training of staff, why they need to wear a mask, because it dramatically shows how it stops droplets from coming out of your mouth. Well, let me move to the second phase, which is to just quickly tell you where we're at. Um, we now have confirmed cases 9,706 with 367 deaths. The death rate has been coming steadily down, and I think that's because the number of confirmed cases that are in younger and healthier people has gone up. Um, we have talked a lot in all sorts of settings about bending the curve. And so I developed this slide a long time ago that I've been tracking for a long time, that my original message for a long time, this is just a simple dotted trend line, no fancy statistics, just a straight line. And you can see for weeks, we haven't moved the trend at all until just recently. And now we're really bending the curve, uh, sadly in the wrong direction. So in fact, here's today's data there were 352 new cases confirmed in Oklahoma. As you guys know, 450 yesterday, which was the largest peak in the state um, since the pandemic started. Our seven day rolling average of cases has shown this dramatic peak and we're higher than at any other point in the pandemic now uh, in Oklahoma. I track 14 days because remember some of the gating criteria for reopening the economy was to look at what you were doing over the past 14 days. This is daily new cases, and that number fluctuates around a lot, but we were at about, what, 56 cases um, two weeks ago uh, to uh, 352 new cases today. Uh, here's the three-day rolling average. Uh, it, it shows the variation, but again, 
354 cases a day on average over the last three days in Oklahoma. So dramatically higher than we peaked out originally at the end of March, early April. This is the number that the governor has talked about many times that we had this nice slow progression down. Um, but then over the past week, a little bit over a week, we've seen this dramatic increase in the number of new cases. So here's the number of three day rolling average, the trend line, uh, which went from 85 to 354. And you can see the seven day rolling average, which flattens out that day to day variation in all of the numbers. Uh, we were on average 91 cases a day two weeks ago. We are now on average 265 new cases a day in Oklahoma. So the trends are all bad uh, for 14 days. Here's the hotspot. This is actually yesterday's data. <clears throat> I just updated the data in a subsequent set of slides for today. Again, Tulsa is the hotspot currently. And in fact, in today's data, Tulsa had more cases than Oklahoma County. And then of course, Cleveland County, Payne, was, Payne County was third today. Cleveland County was fourth in today's data. Uh, but clearly it's the metropolitan areas that are still driving the majority of the pandemic. And of course, I'm sure all of you know of the great concern about a big rally happening in Tulsa at the same time that we're seeing this big surge in new cases. This is one where I've uh, uh, um, been trying to dispel some myths that I think are being routinely um, spread in Oklahoma. Uh, I even heard this yesterday uh, in a press conference at the White House. We are not doing more tests now. Test peaked on the week of May 17th. We did 37,000 that week, and we've gone down ever since. Now, this isn't a complete week's data. I haven't added in today's numbers yet. But what's happened is we were down the week of May 25th that only 1.8% of tests run in the state were positive. Currently, this week, we're up to 5.8% of tests that are run are positive. So there's been this marked increase in the percentage of specimens tested that are positive. The spike is not due to doing more tests. Tests have gone down for the past several weeks. Here's what it looks like on a daily basis. Um, a little bit harder to read. The red line is the percent of tests that are positive. The blue line, the blue bars are the number of tests that are reported each day by the health department. They only report this data five days a week. So you see a big spike every Monday because it represents three days worth of data. But it's really clear when you look at where the percent positive, it got really low down to on May 25th. That day, it was 1.3% of the specimens were positive. Last week, we hit 6.7% of the specimens positive. So <clears throat> again, <clears throat> why is my data different from what the governor's reporting? He's reporting the cumulative number of positive tests divided by the cumulative number of tests done since the pandemic started. Uh, and that number is about 3.8%. But when you look at it on a daily basis, I think it gives you a much better picture of what's happening with the pandemic. Here's hospitalizations. Again, we hit 211 for PUIs and confirmed cases yesterday. Today's data will be out late today. <clears throat> but again, um, steady increase for the past three weeks. And then here's confirmed cases. I, I don't pay much attention to PUIs anymore because most of us in the hospital can get a confirmation test back pretty quickly. And um, we know <clears throat> whether a patient is confirmed or not. We, hit, we only had 69 confirmed cases in the hospital on June 1st. Today, um, as of yesterday, we had 129 confirmed cases in the hospital in Oklahoma. So that number is going up uh, fairly rapidly, which we expected. So lastly, I just talk about some of the work that I'm doing with the university, and that's how we go about re reopening. You know, and I I lose sleep at night about this because 22,000 undergraduates will potentially descend on Norman uh, in August. Um, as you know, there's a lot of people who really want sports like football to come back. Um, uh, so there are all sorts of challenges, and and so we've been having numerous conversations about how we address keeping this large student body safe. One of the recommendations that had been made early in the process is that we would do PCR testing on every single student when they hit the campus. That quickly became apparent that that wasn't feasible, uh, nor would it tell us too much because they could go out the next weekend and be positive. 
<clears throat> so we will be screening every student on arrival, doing certain things such as uh, symptom screening and screening for any direct contacts. Anybody positive will get tested. <clears throat> and then we are going to do very robust contact tracing and testing if we have any cases and isolation. We've set aside a number of apartment units that are single uh, occupancy that we will use for any student that tests positive and we will isolate them. We will have universal masking policy on all three um, OU campuses. Um, that's been a bit difficult to convince everybody we needed to do, but honestly, I don't know of any other intervention that's going to be that effective. Where we can, we'll be doing physical distancing. All the break rooms have had furniture removed. Cafeterias have had furniture removed. There'll be one-way flow of traffic through our cafeterias. Uh, there will be no self-serve. Um, there'll be people that actually uh, hand out the food. We'll do lots of grab and go and other things, but there won't be any, <clears throat> any large cafeteria seating or other things uh, for the university, at least as we start off. And then I spent time earlier today talking about um, football, and I can't even begin to tell you how we're going to make some of those decisions at this point. Uh, we're having conversations with the Big 12, the NCAA, and others to see if there's any consistency across the country in what happens with college athletics this coming year. I'm going to end <clears throat> by trying to dispel one last myth that I hear a lot. <clears throat> I, I see it on social media a lot. Let's just let people get infected and develop herd immunity. So I said, okay, let's look at what that looks like. Let's assume being conservative that only 60% of Oklahoma needs to be immune to achieve herd immunity. That means we'd have to have 2.4 million people infected. And if I assume that the mortality rate is only 0.3%, I tried to be fairly conservative, which is three times what influenza is, uh, 7,200 Oklahomans would die uh, at 0.3%. So I don't think there are too many people in healthcare that really want us to get to herd immunity by just letting the viral infection run rampant. Um, one thing we don't know is if you've been infected and recovered, we don't know how long you may be immune because for other coronaviruses, that immunity doesn't last for long periods of time. So, so again, I, I've, I've highlighted this just to make, make it clear that uh, we need a vaccine if we're really going to get this under control and we don't want to see a lot of people in hospitals and a lot of people die in Oklahoma. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I know I don't uh, begin to replace Brent Brown, uh, but I wanted to share with you the information that I had. Thank you so much, Dr. Botts, for, for being able to join us, and Dr. Sutta, Dr. Rousseau. Uh, we're right up at our time, uh, so we won't get to all the questions, but there are a couple that I wanted to, uh, uh, that came through, and Dr. Botts, I know you're shocked, you know, you, you were ahead of us knowing we'd get questions about football, so uh, just real quickly for Dr. Rousseau or Dr. Sutta, uh, a question came through, uh, do you have any uh, sequela from your illness? Uh, Dr. Sutta, has your lung capacity returned to be able to play with your children normally? What's kind of the, the long-term effects? Well, I can say for me, uh, yeah, I think we are, both my wife and I are fully recovered. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, not exercising as much. Um, and I certainly had concerns about it. I went ahead and had a follow-up chest X-ray and we compared the chest X-rays and they look good. But my lung capacity did come up, uh, come up uh, and I actually started riding my bicycle again. So I'm riding about eight miles at, uh, at a time, and that seems to be uh, uh, doing well. So, so far, no sequelae. Yeah, and I would agree. I, I feel uh, just fine, actually. Uh, I feel really good. Um, no residual uh, effects, except there are times when uh, my heart may flutter a little bit, and I just don't know if that's uh, me or if that's if that's just uh, a society's disregard of this virus that's making my heart flutter or, or, or when your lovely wife comes in the room so <laughs> oh, <cool. laughs> um, Dr. Brassel we've gotten a couple questions about uh, environmental measures in restaurants things of that nature do you have any opinion on things such as uh, germicidal UV light HEPA filters 
in things like restaurants, dorms, cafeterias, things of that nature? Yeah, we've had that conversation a lot with uh, the university. They, uh, you may know, they they have installed a bunch of hospital grade filters in a lot of the HVAC systems, and then they're going to give a try to this uh, dry hydrogen peroxide device that that clearly reduces petri cell petri dish counts of organisms. Whether it'll reduce infections or not is not entirely clear to me at this point. Um, I think enhanced disinfection is really important. Uh, we're doing it at the university. Um, I've also had the opportunity to read many of the reopening plans for the casinos. They actually put together some amazing plans of disinfection, physical distancing. They are requiring masks of everybody, employees, patrons, and everybody. Um, so I think it's just one more piece of that public health puzzle to help reduce transmission of the virus. As I mentioned earlier, CDC downplayed to a certain extent the role of surface contamination as a cause of the infection, feeling that respiratory droplets still represent the most common mode of transmission. I hope, I hope I'm unmuted. Um, and last question on this, as you can imagine, I'm sure, you know, we at OSMA, and I'm sure you've gotten a lot of questions about Tulsa this weekend and, and lots of comments. Um, I, I think all of us on, on this call are all on the same page with what our opinion is, but just all that aside, uh, what do you what do you think is going to be, you know, after this weekend, what are we going to see and what do you think is kind of the realistic lag time that we'll see before we really know what the true impact is? Yeah, it's a really good question and one we've been asked a lot. So um, I think in part it's going to depend on how many people take up that mask that they're going to be given and actually wear it. Um, as you know, uh, the uh, most people, if they're going to become symptomatic, will become symptomatic. Day five is about the median time to, to develop symptoms. So I would expect and that if people wait until they're symptomatic to be tested, that we won't see much in terms of the numbers for at least a week. Uh, but then after, so I, I'm, I've been telling people, I think, you know, the numbers, if they go up because of that, about a week into it is when we'll see it. You know, 40 to 45 percent of people who get the infection are asymptomatic and can still spread the virus. So we may see ongoing community spread for quite some time. Okay. Well, certainly this is, uh, you know, I, I wish I could say this would be the last of our series on, on COVID CMEs, but uh, I'm sure this will be an ongoing series. So again, thanks to all three of our presenters today. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, all of the speakers' presentations will be available on the OSMA website. I'd encourage you to go check out uh, check that out. Uh, if you have any trouble logging in uh, to get your CME credit, reach out to Sandy Deba, our CME manager. She'll be happy to walk you through that and help take care of that. So. Again, uh, all three of our presenters, thank you so much for taking time out this afternoon to join us. And uh, we look forward to uh, ho hopefully being able to speak in person and under better circumstances soon. So uh, thank you all and everybody have a great weekend.